I2C is a reasonably simple two-wire serial protocol commonly used to connect sensors and other accessories to microcontrollers. It's handy to have an I2C target on the Tang Nano 9K or other FPGA board to allow a microcontroller to initiate commands to it and to exchange data with it. This video is about finding a suitable open source Verilog I2C target soft IP core and using it on the Tang Nano 9K with a Raspberry Pi acting as the I2C initiator. Specifically, the Tang Nano will implement a simple pulse width modulation signal generator commanded via I2C. We'll demonstrate it by controlling an LED's brightness. Here's the test setup showing the Raspberry Pi in the Tang Nano 9K. It's very simple. The low signal count is a key benefit of I2C. We'll use my ADALM2000 as an oscilloscope and logic analyzer to look at some signals. This diagram shows the connections between the Raspberry Pi and the Tang Nano 9K. We use the standard I2C pins on the Raspberry Pi, a Model 3B in this case. It's important to note that this Raspberry Pi already has 1.8K pull-up resistors on SDA and SCL. I2C will not work without pull-ups because it assumes the IOs are working in open drain mode. We'll also connect an LED to the Tang Nano and control its brightness. In addition, we will use the LEDs and the 27 MHz oscillator on the Tang Nano board itself. My goal was to find a already written I2C target. I didn't think I'd need to write one from scratch since this is such a common function. So I just used Google to search for them. And I found several, and I'm going to talk first about the one that I like best, and at the end of the video I'll mention some others. But the, the one that I'm using is written by a guy called Steve Fielding, and it's hosted on this open cores site. Um, but I had some trouble with this. You can't actually down, download a core, um, meaning an implementation of something, unless you create an account. So I went through the process of creating an account, but I keep not getting the uh, email from them that I have to get to confirm my account. So I can't actually download anything from open cores. But I noticed this other uh, GitHub site where somebody had essentially copied all of the uh, soft IP cores from open cores onto this GitHub. And this is legal to do uh, because these are open source licenses. And so here you just have to use Git to obtain the cores. And so I'll show you how to do that to, to get this core written by Steve Fielding. The first step is to get a URL to do a git clone from. So you do that by clicking on code, selecting HTTPS, and then if you click here, it copies the URL you need to the clipboard. So we'll switch to a text window now. To get the core that we want, you have to essentially download the entire repository. And the way you do that with git is you say git clone, and then paste the URL that we just got from the website. And then this will take a while. So we'll come back when it's done. And now it's done. And, and this creates a directory called IP cores. So if you look there, there's nothing there except this readme, um, which describes all of, the, all of the cores that are present. Now you can also see them all by doing a git branch uh, minus a. And all of the different IP cores are, are in different git branches. So you can see them all this way. And I'm interested in I squared C, so I can grep for I, I to C. And then the one that I want is this, is this I squared C slave. So to get that, we have to check out this particular branch. So we get git checkout and then minus B for a local name, which I can call the I to C target or something like that. And then paste the name of the remote branch and that switches to the branch that contains the I2C target. So if you look in here, you'll see a bunch of directories and a readme and some documentation, which is well worth looking at. Um, but the code that you want to put in into your FPGA project is inside this directory called RTL. And so these are the files that you would copy to the Tang Nano 9K project. So let's try it. First, we have to create a project in the Gowan IDE in the usual way. So we'll call it test I2C. And then we need to pick the correct series of FPGA and the correct FPGA. Create the project. And now we have to copy the files that we just mentioned. 
And in, in addition, I created a constraints file that we'll look at later. So we copy those to the project directory, like so. Go back to the IDE, add files. And we just add all of these. And there's the, this um, slave define.v file contains one thing that has to be changed and one thing that we will change. So this is where you set the, the uh, I squared C address of the target. And I'm going to change that from 3C to 3.1 for no particular reason, except that's what I've been using. And the required change is to is to select the clock frequency that you're going to be using in, in your design. And we're going to use the oscillator that's on the Tang Nano 9K board, and it runs at 27 megahertz, which is fast enough for, for this project. So I can save that and maybe close it. And then let's look at uh, Slave Top. This is a top level module that the author created essentially for testing. And we can use this as is. The my the bits in register zero are exposed at this level and we can use those later but but we won't use them now so we'll ignore them they don't hurt anything and so let's see the next thing well actually at this point we can um, synthesize and so that worked and before we do place and route let's look at the constraints file so i created this earlier just to save time but um, SDA is on pin 51, and I'm making that an open drain, which I think is a, it, I mean, it's a good idea. It's the I squared C standard. There's ways to, in Verilog that you could avoid it, but but in the Gowan tools, select that to be open drain. And notice that I've said pull mode none uh, for both SDA and S SCL, and that's because of the pull-up resistors that are already on the Raspberry Pi board. Those are 1.8K pull-ups. I've changed the voltages to or to 3.3, so LVC MOS 3.3 in all cases. And uh, let's see, reset. I have given this a pull down in order to have the part not in the target not not in reset by by default. So now uh, we should be able to place and route and create the bitstream file, which as usual takes a little bit of time. So that's done. And now we can load it onto the FPGA using my little script, which I've shown you before. So that's using open FPGA loader. And now we're ready to go. The FPGA should be acting as an I squared C target. And we're going to test it from the Raspberry Pi. And so this directory contains a small test program that I wrote. And but first, the Linux contains a, a package called I2C or I2C tools, which gives you some handy commands for testing I squared C devices. So I've previously installed these as well as the library my test program uses. Um, so well, we can just use them. So I2C detect uh, does a bus scan minus y prevents it from asking if you really want to do that because these i squared c programs can be dangerous to systems like you might be really careful doing these on a linux pc but on raspberry pi it's all right so this is saying look for all of the devices on bus one of the raspberry pi and sure enough it finds our our device 31 which is what we specified as the target address just before we did the build and so now the test program uh, or the program as it comes from from the author uh, creates uh, actually eight registers i guess the first four of which are read write registers where you can read and write all of the bits in the registers so to write a to well to read a register you can use i2c tools i2c uh, get and again minus y to prevent it from asking bus one device 31 register zero and so now we've read register zero and we can use I, i2c set to set that to something like one two so now if i read it i get one two and we can do the same thing for all of the other registers but this test program that i wrote um, what it does is well and i'll put this on github by the way so there'll be a link below so it opens the i squared c bus which on raspbian this is bus one that's its name and then it sets the address of the slave to hex 31 and and then it programmatically 
um, writes uh, basically every value to every register, also reading it back, and um, and it so it does quite a few of quite a few register accesses. So I can make this by typing make because it's already done, and run it, and it so now it's read and written all of the registers of the target with all possible values. So if we go back and do our read again that should be FF because that's the last thing that this program writes. So you can see that the target is working. And the next step is to integrate something else with it to, to make the I squared C target do something other than just provide registers that can be read and written. I added some functionality to make the I squared C target be a PWM controller so it can control the brightness of an LED. The only changes are in slave top and in the constraints file. So let's first look at slave top. So what have I done? Well, I got rid of my reg zero as part of the interface because we don't need it. And I replaced it with a, a new output PWM pin, which will be on pin 31, I think. That's correct. And uh, so it's declared down here as well. All of the other changes in this file are in this area here, bracketed by these comments. And so the, the way that this PWM controller is going to work is it's going to be based on a counter counting at 27 megahertz, the clock frequency that we're using. And, and so the PWM frequency is determined by counting up to 51,000. And that's chosen to give a PWM frequency of about 529 hertz, because 27 times 10 to the 6 divided by 51,000 is about 529. It's also important that I, I chose 51,000 thousand to be an even multiple of 255 and you'll see how that works below but basically when the user uh, uses an i squared c set for example to set register zero to zero that will turn the led off by making the pwm output always zero and when it's set to 255 the led will be solid on because pwm output will be on all the time and intermediate values will give a changing duty cycle. So like if you were to write 128 to my red zero, then the LED would be on half the time. And we'll, we'll look at that later with an oscilloscope so you can see exactly how that works if you're not familiar with pulse, pulse, width, pulse width modulation. So the way this counter works is basically on the positive edge of the clock, it just does a bunch of checks. So when the counter reaches 51,000 minus one, that's actually the beginning of, a, of the period of the PWM signal. And so it has to start driving PWM val. And if the value of the register is zero, we want it to stay, the value to stay zero all the time. So we start it at zero, otherwise we start it at one, and then we're gonna shut it off when the counter reaches a larger value. And that's what this LSIF does. So when the PWM counter reaches 200 times whatever my reg zero is set to, now it's time to set PWM val to be off. And that happens here. And we continue counting to complete the cycle. And if neither are true, we just keep counting until the, the counter reaches 51,000 minus one again. So that's how this works. And so we can, let's see, synthesize it. And you'll notice a couple of warnings uh, associated with uh, lines 82 and 85. And that's just saying that the counter could overflow, which is true, but it won't because we don't let it get bigger than 51,000. And it's a 16-bit counter, by the way. Um, and so after that, we place in route. And that should work normally, but takes a while as usual. So that completed, but I guess I forgot to show you the constraints file. It's the, where the other change is. And there, all I did was add pin 31, because that's connected to the LED that we're going to control the brightness of. And the LED is connected via a 1K uh, current limiting resistor, by the way, which is important. The, I, I guess I don't trust the, we don't, you don't want to put too much current through the output pin from the FPGA. So I used a 1K for that. So the next thing we would do is, is load it using our usual script. And now, now we should have a I squared C controlled PWM controller. So we'll have to switch setup here so you can see it working. Okay, now we have a view of the LED. 
and the Raspberry Pi command prompt. And we also have an oscilloscope view of the PWM signal courtesy of the ADALM2000. So we're currently set to have a duty cycle of 50% and we can see the LEDs nicely lit. We could change that to zero and turn the LED off completely. We could change that to FF and make the LED solidly on. Or we could try something very small, make just a little pulse. And so the LED is just barely visible as being lit. We can see it go up a little bit if we increase. Or we could move it to, uh, I don't know, C0, make it pretty bright. So you can see it's working pretty well. The ADALM2000 also has a logic analyzer, so we could switch to that. And we could look at that um, let's say we set it to 14 or 13 so you can see it shows the data right of 13. we could also do a read and see what that looks like so i to see get and we see the read of a 13 as well so the uh, logic analyzer is helpful in debugging what goes on with i squared c that was the i squared c target in action but before we close this topic, let's take a look at something else. There's this file registerinterface.v, and you might change this or work on this if you're integrating different things with this I squared C target. So this module contains the uh, allocation of the actual storage for the registers right here. And notice also there's this data out. So what happens on a read? Um, well, basically based on the address, what you have to do is to provide a value to data out. So that could come from anywhere, and he's just got it coming from these register settings. And similarly on a write, you know, with write enables true, then you have a case based on address. So your job there is to take the data from data in and do whatever you want with it. So this is an important module in this implementation. I had said that I wanted to mention a couple of other I squared C targets. And there are some things that are available in the IDE itself here. So if I open up the IP core generator and soft IP cores look in interface and interconnect, there's an I squared C master that I haven't tried. Um, but one that I did try is this thing that basically creates a bridge between I squared C and a UART. So whatever you enter into the I squared C shows up on the UART and vice versa. And this was pretty easy to instantiate, but it never worked for me. I, I could see it when I did the I squared C detect, but it has some registers that you should be able to read and write, and those never fully worked, and I don't know why. And when you instantiate these things, what you get is an encrypted block. And the build process does kind of partially un, unveil that, but there's no easy to read source code. So there's no way to easily at least extract the I squared C target from this and no way to figure out why it didn't work for me. So that, that wasn't too convenient. I also want to mention the uh, I squared C target in at this website here. I'll put a link below. And this one's interesting because it doesn't use any clock other than the I squared C clock itself, which can be a disadvantage. But I was able to get this one to work pretty easily. And it's quite small and simple. So the thing available from this GitHub is actually a modification of an implementation by Daniel Beer. The author put a link to Daniel Beer's original notes. This is a very nice write-up of how this slave works. And if you scroll down though, you can see one thing that's a little bit, makes it a little bit more difficult to use. And, and that's because there is only the one clock, synchronizing this implementation with, with whatever else you want the I squared C target to do can be more difficult. So you can read about this in this write-up. I also found that, that it is a little bit more glitch prone. And so I wanted to show you the constraints file that I used with it. And so there's this option, um, setting hysteresis to high, that's available to you on the, on the Gowan IDE. And so in order to make this implementation fully reliable, I had to set that hysteresis to high. So that's just something to know about, but I didn't, didn't need it with the uh, one we looked at first. I'm looking forward to using this I squared C target in future projects as I continue to explore the Tang Nano 9K. I'll end this video here. See below for links and thanks for watching.